is that really in the Bible? You live in a world where everyone has an opinion about the Bible. Of what values are your beliefs if they are not clearly found in the pages of your Bible? The question we must ask is, are your opinions and beliefs really found in the Bible? Well, hello, I'm David Freeman with Is That Really in the Bible? Back in the summer this year, we went to Dollywood and uh, we watched some of the country western shows. They're very good, great shows. And uh, we went to what was called the Dreamland Drive-In. It was a trip down memory lane. That was an excellent show. It had the hit songs from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, but it took the audience back in time and you know, it started out, you know, they, the young teenagers, boys and girls, and they, they pull up in the old, uh, I don't know if that was a Studebaker, what kind of car that was, but ugly looking thing, but had his car, and, you know, they, 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 the, the girl meets, girl, a boy meets girl, and they've got their relationships going on, and <clears throat> some of them last, some of them, some of those relationships don't, but, uh, and he went through all the music, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and the 80s music. And at the end of the show, this is old car, the old Studebaker or whatever it was, sort of beat it up and needs a paint job desperately. But they pull back up to the old drive-in. And the drive-in has long since been closed down. The old neon sign is hanging down. And then just go back there to reminisce. And he steps out of his car with a walking cane. And she steps out with her hair up in a bun. Obviously, they had aged a lot by that time. And I, as I watched it, I, I thought, you know, that is exactly like my life. It's, it's sort of what my life has been, uh, or it's what my life will be like. I mean, it's, 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 it was like seeing your life in pictures, picture frames. And it was a powerful, very powerful show. Your life is like a dream. You know, they say that dreams only last uh, experience two or three seconds and when you dream but most people have it six to eight dreams a night but they only last a couple seconds but you know your life is just like a dream really it'll be over with like a dream and the bible speaks to this issue it says in james 4 and verse 14 it says wherefore you know not what shall be on tomorrow but what is your life? It is even as a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Yeah, life is like a dream. First Peter 1 and verse 24 says, For all the grass is as, all the flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flowers thereof falleth, fadeth away, or falleth away. And you sort of look sometimes in the mirror and you realize, okay, I'm starting to wither. I'm starting to wither. And you know, your, your Bible says, it talks about our age. How long are we going to live on this earth? Psalms 90 and verse 9 says, For all the days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our year, year as a tale that is told. Yes, we spend our years as a tale that is told. Reminds me of the song by Bruce Springsteen, Glory Days where we talk about the glory days when we were hot and we were, we were something else back then. The glory days. Yeah. Psalms 90 and verse 10, it says, The days of our years are three score years and ten. A score is twenty. So we're saying, okay, three score and ten, that's seventy. But if by reason of strength they be four score, okay, that's eighty years. Yet is their strength labor and sorrow for it is soon cut off and we fly away yes yeah, so life will be over with before you know it you know 70 or 80 years that's about the average lifespan there but uh you know I've, i once heard some statistics that the person that lives to be 78 years of age spends four years on the toilet 26 years sleeping nine years watching tv and I, I looked at that and I thought, you know, that only leaves 39 years to get anything done. 39 years to get anything done. I was also looking at how Americans spend their time or spend each day. Most Americans spend one hour online a day. Religious activities, religious activities, 10 minutes a day. Yeah, not much time for that. 
Uh, thinking and relaxing, 19 minutes a day. Leisure activity, five hours. Watching TV, three hours. You know, our priorities are all screwed up, I'll tell you that. When you look at those statistics, 1 John 2 and verse 17 says, And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. What is the lust thereof? Well, it's, it's things like leisure activity five hours a day, watching TV three hours a day, one hour online. You know, the typical American is wasting probably about eight hours a day. But you know, that, was, that sort of bothered me when I thought, when, you know, looking at this leisure time. When I was at Dollywood entertaining myself, I thought, what am I doing? All I'm doing is entertaining myself and there's no contentment. You know, if you spent the rest of your day trying to entertain, rest of your life, trying to entertain yourself, you'd be miserable. You would be. No, that's, that, that's not what brings you true joy and happiness. It's not. You know what brings you joy and happiness? It's being productive. It's being, it's working. It's doing something with your hands. That's what makes us happy when we are productive. Well, 1 John 2 and verse 17, it says, But he that doeth the will of God abides forever. So if I can figure out, okay, if we can figure out what the will of God is, then maybe we can abide forever. Uh, now, I'll tell you something I'm almost ashamed of. I used to believe that whatever God wanted me to do would be something that I hated. You know, I, I would thought, well, whatever God wants me to do is going to be boring. It's going to lack creativity. What's the worst thing I can imagine? That, that will probably be the thing the Lord wants me to do. I had a distorted, corrupted view about God back then. Yeah, I really did. Because your Bible says this in Matthew 7 and verse 9. It gives this illustration, this example of the way God is. He says, what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good gifts to them to ask him? Why would God ask you to do something that you absolutely hated? The point is, he wouldn't. He wouldn't. Now, as a parent, we understand this. You want your children to be successful. You want your children to be blessed. You want your children to find the love of their life. You want, to, you want your children to find, out, find that thing that makes them come alive. The work they will enjoy. That's what, as parents, we want what's best for our children. And God is no different when it comes to you. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? In other words, if you, if we, with our corrupt character, know how to give good things to our children, then how much more will God, who is perfect in character and knows you better than you know yourself, give you good things? Will give you the desires of your heart? Will allow you to do that thing that makes you come alive? I have a plaque on my wall in my garage says this, it says, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and go do that. Because what the world needs are people who have come alive. <clears throat> Nothing could be truer. Nothing could be truer. What the world needs are people who have come alive. That can be a greater witness of the power of God than, than nearly anything. You being alive. Instead of moping around like you're half dead and half sick and don't know what to do with yourself and don't know what the God's will is and you're bored and you're, you're troubling other people and, you know, you <clears throat> Yeah, we need to come alive as God's people. We need to come alive. Now, let me ask you a question. What do you love to do? What makes you happy? If we could just get honest with God. God, this is what I love to do. This is what makes me happy. This is what makes me come alive. If we could just be honest with God. Psalms 37 and verse 4, it says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of your heart. What is the desires of your heart? 
And of course, the condition here, in order for God to give you the desires of your heart, you need to de delight yourself in the Lord. You see, the problem is this. <clears throat> we, as human beings, we compartmentalize our lives. We, we say things like, well, Lord, this is what I love to do, but it has nothing to do with, re with religion. You see, I love to fish. I love to hunt. I love to paint. I love to organize things. I, know, I love to clean, you know. Me and my wife, we both love to clean. Greatest thrill, I mean, you know, just take something that needs cleaning and clean it. And I don't even understand it myself. People get upset of us at us because we love to clean. You know, but we do. We just love to clean. We're both like that. We're like two peas in a pod when it comes to that issue. You know, we love to clean things. And, uh, but I don't love, okay, God, I love to do all these things, but I don't love to pray. I don't love to go to church. I don't love to sing. I don't love religious activities. I sure don't want to go to a monastery or anything like that. I don't love that stuff. We have our religious life in a compartment. And we have the real you in another compartment. Uh, this is what I mean by we compartmentalize our lives. You know, we have, okay, this is my little itty-bitty religious apartment. It's about that big, you know, square, you know, church on Sunday, one hour, and that's it. Uh, and then we have the real you over here in a bigger compartment. We comp we, but we separate these areas. Uh, but, but here's the thing. You see, time is running out. It's time for you to try trusting God. After all, what do you have to lose? It's time for you to start trusting God. God is not asking for the impossible. Again, 1 John 2 and verse 17, But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So let's figure out what God's will is for you. All right? Number one. Number one. God wants his children to be healthy, happy, and to prosper. Okay? First, we've got to get our minds around that one. God wants you, his children, to be healthy, happy, and to prosper. Uh, 3 John 1 and verse 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Yeah. I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health. Okay. We've got we to gotta wrap our minds around that God is a good God. And he desires good things for his children. We have to wrap our minds around this. Second one. God wants you to find the desires of your heart. That thing that makes you come alive. He wants you to find that. He doesn't want you to struggle through all your life wondering what it is. Dreaming about it or anything. He wants you to get it. Okay, that thing that makes you come alive. Psalms 34. 7 and verse 4, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of your heart. Third, <clears throat> God doesn't want your life to be compartmentalized, broken up in all these different areas. In other words, you got one area of things that you love to do, and then you got another area called religion. No, he wants the whole you, all of you. Wingtip to wingtip, head to toe. He wants the thing you love to do to be your religion. Now that's 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 a matter that's a fascinating concept. He wants the thing that you love to do to be your religion. He does not he does not want you to compartmentalize your life. Sort of like that saying, you know, a religious man is a man in church thinking about fishing. Uh, a spiritual man is a man fishing, thinking about God. You know, God wants you to be a spiritual man. So don't compartmentalize your life. He wants all of you. Okay. So let's see, okay, what is God's will for you? Let's, let's break it down. Romans 12 and verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, it's not unreasonable. It's reasonable to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, it says offer, now, now notice this. It doesn't say offer your mind, your spirit, or your emotions, although that's important also. I'll touch on that a little bit later.
But the first thing is you do is you offer your bodies. It says to offer your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, what is your body? What is your body? Well, you, you want to maybe, well, don't tell me you've done this, but when you have time, you get up in the morning or whatever, look at your, strip down butt naked and look at yourself in the mirror. What you are seeing is your body, which houses your emotions, your spirit, and everything else. But that's your body. Now, does God care about your body? Does he care about your health? Does he care about how much you eat, how much you drink, uh, your physical appearance, how healthy you are? I, I think he does. I think he does. Now, this is not rocket science, what I'm about to tell you here. But there are basically three things, three areas that you need to have in order to be healthy, to present your body as a living sacrifice to God. Number one, you need to eat a healthy diet. Number two, you need to exercise. And number three, you need to get plenty of sleep. Now, this is not, again, this is not too complicated, is it? No, it's not. You need to eat a healthy diet. Now, let me tell you something about diet. You go into, I went into Kroger's. It's a beautiful, and the fruits and vegetables. I walked into that section there, and they had the rain, the mist of rain coming down on the fruits and vegetables. They even had the sound of a thunderstorm. I mean, it was beautiful. And I'm looking at across those beautiful orange and reds and yellows and grapes and all the beautiful colors that just catches your eye. And I think, wow, this is like a paradise here in Kroger's, for pity's sake. I was just standing there looking at it. I mean, you know, I was impressed with it. Beautiful things to eat. Okay, a healthy diet. Now, if you're the type, you go into the grocery store, you avoid all that, that section, and you go quickly to the frozen foods, and you look at the TV dinner or something that you can pop in the microwave real quick because you don't have time to eat healthy. Well, if that describes you, you are destroying your body. There's a lot that can be said about the issue of health. I could talk about organic meat, eating organic foods and fruits and vegetables. Uh, you'll just be a lot better off. Now, yeah, it's more expensive, but how important is your health? First of all, this scripture says, offer your body a living sacrifice. It's the temple of God, so you need to be concerned about this. Exercise. Okay, how hard is it, you know? The need to, let's say, walk every day, to get some exercise, to walk a mile or two, or, whatever, or get a treadmill, whatever you need to do this, but to exercise daily. And third, to get plenty of sleep. Now, the three things that people are lacking in are, number one, eating a healthy diet, exercise, and getting a pl plenty of sleep. That's, that's the three things that people are lacking in. And yet, it's not complicated. It's not complicated. And yet, we don't do it. Now, if you don't have a healthy body, you can't serve God the way he desires to be served. Now, that's a fascinating concept worth repeating. If you don't have a healthy body, you can't serve God the way he desires to be served. So rule number one, first thing you do when you get up, we're talking about finding God's will. What is God's will for you? Rule number one, first thing you do, that you present your body a living sacrifice because if you don't have your health you don't have anything you don't have anything how important is health to god i think it's critical diet exercise you know i think about okay overweight if you're 40 pounds overweight if i were to put on a jacket right now that had 40 pounds of weight in them in the jacket i put this jacket on and I worked all day long, and I walked around, and I worked, climbed up the ladder and up the scaffold, and, and I do construction work. That's how I make a living. But I wore that jacket with 40 extra pounds all day long. At the end of the day, my body would be worn out. My joints would be aching. I would be aching all over. Now, the reason you don't notice it is because it happens gradually. You've put that extra 40 pounds on over a period of two or three years. And that's the reason you don't notice it. notice it. But I'm telling you, you're killing yourself. You are killing yourself. Your body, you're stressing your body out. You know, 
If I don't have a healthy body, I'm not going to be able to serve you well at all. That's what we need to wrap our minds around when it comes to a relationship with God. This verse says to offer your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, I want to make a connection here. Okay, offer your body, what you see in the mirror when you're naked, a living sacrifice. Now, okay, here's the connection. In the Old Testament, the sacrifices that were offered to God had to be without blemish. God did not accept some kind of lame, diseased animal on that sacrifice. It had to be without blemish. Just look up at those words, without blemish, and see how many times that reference comes up. Those sacrifices had to be without any blemish. My point is this. A living sacrifice could have no blemishes. And God says, offer your body a living sacrifice. Now, consider this. You've got blemishes that are keeping you from being productive. You've got blemishes that are keeping you from being a living, productive sacrifice for God. God, how can I serve you with a full heart if all my time and focus is on these blemishes? You know, if you have blemishes, a lot of your focus and energy is going to be on correcting those blem blemishes. You're going to spend a lot of time trying to figure out solutions, trying to figure out, okay, what do I do about this? And you go to the doctor and you, you're, that might not even be good advice, or, you know, but you try to look out a natural cure, and, but you're spending all this time trying to figure out a solution to these blemishes. Well, my point is God heals living sacrifices and he don't accept any blemishes. So the next time you go to God in prayer, you might want to use that as a pry bar, you know, sometimes we just need a little leverage here. You got a toolbox called healing. In that toolbox is a pry bar. And uh, <clears throat> there's a lot on the subject of healing, I could say. But uh, if any sick among you, call for the elders of the church and let them anoint you and all that. But, but this pry bar is that, God, I, I am to be a living sacrifice. And you don't accept any blemishes. And I'm asking you, in order for me to, to serve you, I need to be without blemishes. You know, you can use that next time you go to God in prayer. Okay, so Romans 12 and verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, you make yourself available with a healthy body. And these sacrifices, you know, when these sacrifices were alter, uh, offered on the altar, you know, they, they had to die to self. You have to die to yourself. You, you didn't give out commands and say, okay, Lord, I want you to do this, this, and that for me. And, you know, you, you weren't the ones making the commands, the, the, you know, the sacrifice. No, your, your part is real simple, to die to self. Okay, that, that's point number one. The second point here in, in discovering God's will is the next verse, Romans 12 and verse 2. And this begins to talk about the mind. Okay? And be not conformed to this world, that's a sermon right there, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Have you done that? Have you proven what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? You know, there is a good and acceptable, perfect will of God that is written out in the Bible. It's called the Word of God. It's called the Law of God. That tells you what God expects from you, the Ten Commandments. But then beyond that, beyond what is written down in your Bibles that all people can follow, is that good and acceptable and perfect will that God has for you personally. Only you. You're the only one that can do it. You're the only one that can partake in it. No one else can do that for you. Okay? You need to find out what that is, what that is, good and acceptable and perfect will of God that he has for you as an individual. And you see, it's going to be that thing that will make you come alive. It's going to be that thing that will make you come alive. You know, many years ago, I went with my father to Butterfield Harley Davidson in Roanoke, Virginia. And I went by there recently and looked at the old place and chain link fence was still around it and front doors look pretty much the same it's closed it's been closed down 20 years but i looked at the very spot where me and my father stood 
And I wanted a Harley Davidson LX or S, LX 250 or something like that. AMF made those things back, back then. It was a piece of junk, by the way. But anyway, oh, I loved that Harley. I loved that thing, that 250 bike. And it, and it cost about $1,200. My father was there, and he you know, he'd smile on his face. He was there to help me get it. He was there to help me get what I wanted. And, uh, you know, he said, can you make the payment? Payment, You know, this bike's going to cost $1,200, and you can do work around the house and, and make payments like this, payment about $60 a month. I said, yeah, I can do that. <clears throat> and it's just a, it's an image of a father helping his son get what he wanted. Son, we can do this. I want you to have that image of a father with his arm around you saying, let's do this. Yeah, let's do this. I'm here to help you get what you want. I'm here to help you get that thing that will make you come alive. To do that thing that will help you come alive. You know, don't ever forget this verse in the Bible that we went over earlier. Matthew 7 and verse 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? You know, we work together with God. We don't just sit on our hands and let God do it all, and we definitely don't do it all ourselves. But we work in harmony with God. And you know, you're never gonna have that, that right relationship with God until you, you realize this, until you envision a God with his arm around, a father with his arm around you saying, yeah, I'm on your side, let's do this. There's a lot we can do that God can do when it comes to our blemishes. And there's a lot that we can do when it comes to our blemishes. And together, if you put together this, 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 the, the two of them, what you can do about your blemishes and what God can do, together it is a remedy for success. I'm David Freeman with is that really in the Bible? Many people spend their whole life repeating the same old mistakes. What does it take to have good discernment and good judgment? It takes having the Spirit of God. But what many people overlook is, the Spirit of God is not something that you are born with. Man was created incomplete, missing that spiritual element that would make him complete. The Bible clearly lays out the way to receive the Spirit of God. Learn the step-by-step -step process for receiving the Spirit of God. Order your free copy of Why You Need the Holy Spirit. Order by writing to Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. That's Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. Also, visit us on the web at isthatreallyinthebible.org. Also, you can contact us by email at minister at cogrm.com. That's minister at cogrm.com.